Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. My name is Leah. I'm a program coordinator here at the network. Uh, welcome to the Network for Public Health Law webinar 2021 to 2022 Racial Equity Dataset, a searchable collection of laws related to racial equity. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. The presenter slides, as well as a recording of the webinar, will be available on the network's website in about a week. Um, and you'll also receive an email when they're up on our website as well as a post-webinar survey link, which we would greatly appreciate if you could fill out for us. Please feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the webinar if you have any questions, and our moderator, Q, will try to get to as many as possible. So with that, I'm excited to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Q. Q Dang is the Interim Co-Executive Director for the Network for Public Health Law and Managing Director of Legal Programs and Strategies. Q oversees the work of the network's project teams in advancing law and policy solutions and providing direct legal technical assistance to those working to create healthier, more equitable communities. He also works closely with external partners in public health, as well as community philanthropic and advocacy organizations working to advance health in their communities. Q brings more than 20 years of experience as a public health lawyer, educator, and consultant to the, his network leadership role. So with that, I will pass it on to Q. Thank you, Leah. You know, my slides are not advancing. I don't know if that's just on my screen or... Great, thank Sorry you. Sorry about that, Q. <laughs> Hi, everyone. That's me in Portland, Oregon. Uh, next slide, please. All right, everyone. Well, before I get started, um, I just wanted to uh, mention... Um, our disclaimer here at the Network for Public Health Law, the network promotes public health and health equity through nonpartisan educational re resources and technical assistance. Any materials provided in this presentation are intended solely for educational purposes and do not constitute legal advice. The network's provision of these materials does not create an attorney-client relationship with you or any person and is subject to the network's disclaimer, which uh, we will provide a link to. For legal advice, attendees should consult with their own counsel. All right, so um, I have the pleasure uh, today of moderating this panel and I will be uh, after a brief welcome, um, I will be introducing you to our speakers, and we will be going through a project background with Haley Campbell Garcia. Um, Alexandra Hess will be providing an overview of Monocle and Law Atlases, and then Phyllis Jaden will be uh, doing an introduction to the racial equity data set uh, that we are talking about in today's webinar, and also have a live demo live demonstration for you all um, to follow along with on your own computers and devices as well. So um, I see that um, uh, folks are starting to warm up the chat box. And one thing I like to do at the beginning of webinars is I do like for uh, the participants to just jump into the chat and just get a chance to say your name and say where you're from. And it's going to come go by in a, in a little bit of a blur, but I'm always excited to see that people uh, see connections with one another, people uh, know people from collaborating on previous work. And it's um, a fantastic way to, uh, for me to see those connections happening in real life, uh, even though, or in real time rather, uh, even though sometimes on these webinars, as well as working in things like a racial equity data set, and some of the software uh, and programs that we're going to talk about today it can be a very isolating experience. And um, ultimately, I want you to know that the network is uh, able to provide you with technical assistance on public health law and policy matters. So it's great to see everyone uh, populating the, the chat box with, um, with uh, where they're from. Um, and we will get a chance to hear from you uh, throughout the webinar, and we have questions and answers at the end of the webinar uh, after all of the speakers have had a chance to talk. You're warming up the chat box right now. Feel free to keep using the chat box. If you have questions that you want our panelists to, um, to answer or to discuss, uh, I want you to look at your ruler 
toolbar at the bottom and notice that uh, a couple of spots over from the chat box, there's a Q&A function. And that's where questions uh, should go. You'll notice that you, you are on mute. You aren't able to speak on today's webinar, um, but you are able to put questions into the questions and answers. We will handle most of those at the very end. If there are clarifying questions that make sense to answer between the speakers, we will do that also. So today's webinar uh, will have plenty of time to get to questions and answers uh, and um, move things along. All right, let's um, move on to the next slide, Leah. All right, so first of all, with a project background, um, I, I'm uh, really happy to be able to pronounce, uh, to announce and uh, introduce Haley Campbell Garcia, who is a recent graduate, as you can see up from this photo of the University of Kentucky, Kentucky J. David Rosenberg College of Law. She was a law clerk for the health equity team at the network from 2021 through 2024, where her work focused on a variety of health equity topics, including in large part, this data set that we are looking at today. Although still passionate about public health and health equity, Haley is currently in private practice in Nashville, Tennessee. Over to you, Haley. Thank you very much, Q, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so my role in today's webinar is just to talk with you a little bit about this data set and where the idea of it originally started. Um, so this project started in the mind of Don Hunter, who was the former director of the health equity team at the Network for Public Health Law. It was my first summer working with the network as a law clerk. So way back in 2021, which feels like a long time ago, I guess it really isn't, but law school uh, makes the years feel a million year times longer. Um, and I was really interested in working on a legal epidemiology project. Don was also very interested in uncovering what was going on in state legislatures in the wake of uh, what we have been referring to as the renewed racial justice movement of 2020. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, legal epidemiology is the study of laws as a factor in the cause, distribution, and prevention of disease and injury. And so out of those ideas, the predecessor to this data set was born. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So initially I was utilizing programs, um, free online search programs, Legiscan and Open States primarily, to search for all the state legislation that had been introduced regardless of the ultimate outcome of that legislation. So if a bill was introduced, uh, whether or not it got any sort of movement after that introduction, I was capturing it. Um, Don and I brainstormed initially a set of keywords to use in the search that we thought would reveal the legislation that was pertinent to racial justice or racial equity. Those original keywords were racial equity, racism, intergenerational, implicit bias, health equity, health disparities, and racial disparities. We thought that this combination of keywords would reveal the most comprehensive amount of information about what state legislatures were doing in the 2021 and 2022 legislative sessions. What resulted from this initial search was a massive amount of information. Um, the original collection of data was about 100 pages long. Um, and it was in a table which was organized alphabetically by state and by keyword search. Uh, the state legislatures had obviously been very busy in 2021 and 2022 introducing legislation. Um, not all of that was signed into law, but you could see that states at least were very interested in induce, introducing legislation that was focused on racial equity. We were able to uncover some interesting trends in the data. Um, including in language that was repeated in many bills, uh, whether or not they got passed, um, many bills introduced states which were focused on the prohibition of education on divisive concepts. Um, after some later research, we would uncover that this language stemmed from a Trump era executive order, which you will hear a little bit more about from Phyllis later. Next slide, please. 
So the big question we were left with after gathering all this data was, how do we make it useful to others? The data as it stood was in a format that was just completely unusable for any sort of meaningful interpretation. Um, I mean, it was a word file, so you could theoretically command F search for terms or states that you might be interested in, but it just really wasn't intuitive um, or in a way that we thought people would be able to use it. We did feel really strongly that the data needed to be seen and utilized by others. So we started to think about different ways to organize the data so others could see the important collection of laws. Next slide, please. So our first crack uh, was to take all of the bills and the session laws um, and group them by the social determinants of health. Um, we use the definitions as defined by Healthy People 2030. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the social determinants of health and their definitions. Sarah Rogers, who is also a part of the health equity team, played a large part in taking the data as it was originally collected and categorizing it in an Excel file uh, based on the social determinants of health, as well as other parts of this data set. Um, so now we had a large Excel file, which was a little bit more accessible because you at least had some categories that were intuitive to many people in public health and public health law, but it still wasn't great for use by other people. We did end up preserving the definitions um, and categories of based on the social determinants of health, as you will see a little bit later um, when Phyllis does a live demonstration of the data set. But what we really wanted was a searchable database of information that public health folks and other people could use in their own policymaking or advocacy efforts. Next slide, please. Where the magic really started to happen on this data set uh, was when Don Hunter had a conversation with Temple University Center for Public Health Law Research. I was familiar with Law Atlas, and I know Don was as well prior to this conversation. Um, so they discussed taking our data as it had currently been gathered and utilizing their programs, Monocle and Law Atlas to create a searchable database of the laws that would be both, both visually appealing and intuitive for other people to use. Our data set was unique to Law Atlas because it's both longitudinal and time bound. We looked at laws in all 50 states, that, but only laws that were introduced in 2021 and 2022. So we didn't take into consideration any previously enacted laws or laws which were not still in effect by December 31st, 2022. Because of the way the data was initially gathered based on keyword searches, it took a lot of work uh, to retrofit the data to suit the monocle and law atlas format. Phyllis and I spent many hours working with the data, uh, and there was a bit of a learning curve. Uh, you will hear more about Monocle and Law Atlas programs later on from Alex and exactly, exactly what is required um, in using Monocle to produce data set for publication on Law Atlas. Um, but we do feel like the end result of this data set was absolutely worth it. Um, we are so looking forward to sharing this data with you and having people get their eyes on it and hopefully utilize it for whatever purposes um, they may be interested in it. Um, and we hope you find the data as interesting and useful as we do. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and pass it on back to Q for an another introduction. Thank you, Haley. Um, and I just uh, uh, wanted to uh, say that I've seen a couple of questions pop up in the Q&A. And again, we'll be uh, taking those uh, at the end of the session, but please keep putting those into the Q&A section. Um, so that was a great introduction to the project. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, for an overview of Monocle and Law Atlas, Alexandra Hess. Uh, Alexandra uses she, her pronouns and is the legal training manager for the policy surveillance program at the Center for Public Health Law Research based out of Temple University's Beasley School of Law. She leads and facilitates the center's efforts to provide teaching, training, and technical assistance related to legal epidemiology and policy surveillance methodology and practice. She has also supported the center's policy surveillance projects on state level abortion, school discipline, and preemption laws. We're so pleased to have Alexandra with us today. 
Hi, everyone, and thank you to Haley for that really great background on this project and to Q for that lovely introduction. As I know you all are, I'm so excited to hear from Phyllis today about the racial equity laws data set. But before that, I'm going to talk about the legal research technology tools that were used, as Haley mentioned, to create this data, which are Monocle and Law Atlas. Next slide, please. So as Haley mentioned, this data was not initially collected using our resources, but the research team had ultimately identified Monocle as a really valuable tool that could be used to support the creation and ultimately the publication of their legal data. And so our team has developed a special software service program called Monocle to support the work of not only our own policy surveillance program, but also teams around the world to use Monocle to ultimately build data for use in their own research and practice and to share that with others. The platform applies a question and answer framework, as we'll see in just moment that also accommodates full pin citations so you can link answers to the text that you've collected and create citations to that legal text. The service also includes tools to easily integrate things like quality assurance processes to reduce errors. So you can incorporate quality control to ensure that your data is reliable, that it's accurate, that it's replicable. It allows users as well to organize their research and collaborate on projects, to build legal data both across time and space, and to easily update and maintain their data, and also ultimately to visualize that and easily be able to share their data to Law Atlas, which we will see more in just a second. Next slide, please. So tracking laws requires researchers to examine policies across space and sometimes over time. So this process, as I think Haley kind of highlighted, can quickly become really unwieldy if you're trying to keep track of a ton of policies across, let's say, uh, 50 states, if you're doing a state level data set uh, in spreadsheets or Word documents. So Monocle's interface is really handy in that it allows you to organize your legal research and keep it up to date without having to go back and start over and pull through a ton of documents. So you can sort and mark up your legal text, you can add references, and you can quickly navigate the data using tags that you create yourself. Tracking laws also requires keeping up to date with things like new legislation or amendments, or if you're also tracking case law, court decisions that occur in your own, in the jurisdictions that you're tracking. So tracking the law is really important to understand how features and variations in the law might change over time. And Monocle allows users to easily amend the text of the law to reflect these changes over time and across jurisdictions. And legal research uh, can be expensive, it can be time consuming, and keeping track of all the information can really become overwhelming, especially if you're working on a team project. So if you're collaborating with folks, um, it can be difficult to keep track and to stay organized. But Monocle has really flexible features that let supervisors apply your own management, quality control style. And so ultimately, this makes it easier to create that data. Next slide, please. So Monocle is also really useful at many stages of the policy surveillance process, which is represented by the wheel you see here. So if folks are familiar with policy surveillance or legal epi, you might have seen this wheel before. So the racial equity data set team ultimately used policy surveillance methods to create their legal data. And they, as we will see, developed coding questions. They collected all of those laws that Haley had talked about. And then using Monocle, they coded each of those laws across all 50 states to compile the data set that we will see today. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that they developed coding questions, which is really simple process, especially when you're using Monocle. So it allows you to directly input questions and responses, and you can edit them as needed throughout the life of your project. So you can, in the end, capture all of the features of the law that you want to collect as part of your legal data. And this is just a, a screenshot of the question and response page where you can add all those questions, add responses, edit them over time as needed. Next slide, please. And you can also add new jurisdictions or records to the data set, which is really simple and straightforward in the software. We track the law using what we call records, which are essentially just entries that represent all of the relevant laws within a jurisdiction during a particular span of time. So what we're looking at here is the record page within a data set 
where I can scroll through and see all of those records or entries for each of the jurisdictions, and that's how they're organized within the software. Next slide, please. So in legal research, we start with the text of the law, right? That's what we are reading through, and that's what we're coding based off of. So in Monocle, uh, this involves the ability to add legal text directly into the software. So like you see here, the workspace allows you to have the law and the questions that you developed in one place for every jurisdiction. So when you're doing your legal coding, you're literally just looking at the text and then observing features within that text to answer the questions that you have there on the left. And once you're answering your questions, you can then create citations by simply highlighting text and dragging and dropping those excerpts of legal text into the appropriate question which will ultimately create your citations, we'll see how that's viewable on Law Atlas. Um, so again, Monocle allows us to create a single coding scheme, which is that set of questions and responses, and that gets populated into every jurisdictional record that you code. Next slide, please. So once you've done all of the coding, you want to actually make use of that data, right? And so to do that, you need this essential document, which is called the code book. That, along with the statistical data, is what you would use to do something like a legal evaluation to get a better understanding of the variables that were captured in the data set. So the code book is a complete list of all of the questions, the responses, and the identifiers relevant for the questions that you've developed in the data set. So it includes information like the variable labels, the values, and other markers for the data. And so Monocle is really nice in that it automatically produces the code book so you can readily download it once you've completed your coding for your data set. Next slide, please. And finally, this is what the end product might look like, data that was created from a process transforming the text of the law into empirical data that can ultimately be used for something like evaluation, health outcomes research. Um, but I also want to share more about how we can visualize the data. And again, this is also something that you can download directly from Monocle. So once you've completed all of your coding, you can extract the data in CSV format from the software. Next slide, please. So now I want to talk about where we publish that data to, lawatlas.org. Since our original launch in 2011, Law Atlas is first and foremost a translational dissemination tool for legal data. So it provides access to the data through this platform, helping to visualize and translate the data into ultimately usable information for all different types of audiences. The primary goal of Law Atlas is to ultimately democratize access to the law, to law and policy information, and to support quality research through this open access data. Go to the next slide, please. So if you visit lawatlas.org, you can find the data set that we're talking about today, along with other data and resources that are completely free to access. So on Law Atlas, you can navigate the available legal data. You could also download the data and the code book like we just covered, and also the research protocol of any data set. The research protocol is a document that ultimately outlines the creation of a data set from start to finish. So it details all the ways in which a data set was scoped and created. It includes information on like search terms teams use. It includes information on their coding scheme, who created the data set. And so it's a really helpful document to get an understanding of the parameters of a data set. So all three of those things are downloadable with every data set published on Law Atlas. Next slide, please. So Law Atlas data sets are displayed with an interactive question and answer set. So that's what you see here on the right side of the screen. And it allows you to make selections in that question and answer pane to see all of the selections you've made among jurisdictions. So as you can see here in the racial equity laws data set, I've selected yes to question one. And so it's showing me all the states where a law was enacted in 2021 or 2022 that relates to racial health equity that was still in effect as of December 31st, 2022. So I'm really excited for the publication of this data set. This project was a really unique effort in that it's capturing laws, as Haley mentioned, in a sort of time limited way. So we're only looking for laws that were ultimately proposed 
after a certain point in time before they were enacted and also unique as Phyllis will speak to in a moment because it can be really hard to capture how health and racial equity are actually enumerated in the law. Oftentimes that feature is not explicitly stated in the text of the law. So this team had to the really hard task of coming up with a coding scheme for how they were going to capture that information. Um, and Phyllis will speak a little bit more to that, but I'm going to walk through a few ways in which you can actually navigate the data. So I encourage you all to check it out for yourself. We'll be sharing links so you can access the data set in a moment. Next slide, please. In addition to the map that we just saw, we also have a table view. So that's accessible alongside the map if you prefer to view the details in this way. So you can also see the full list of answers, the full legal text from the table view as well. So I just wanted to make note of that. Next slide, please. So in the map view, there are a couple of different ways where in which you can view and navigate the data. So one is through what we call filter mode. So this is a sort of and query that allows you to view where a jurisdiction has multiple features. So what you're seeing here is a, an example where I've selected yes to questions 1, 1.1, 1.1.1, and 1.1.2. Phyllis will talk a little bit more about um, the meaning of the question numbering in just a moment. But we're asking one, was the law enacted? Does the law relate to healthcare access and quality? Does the law relate to data collection and reporting? And does the law relate to underserved and marginalized populations? So what you're seeing here is those states that had yes coded to all four of those questions. So where all four of those things are true is what you're seeing highlighted on the map. But what if I wanted to see where a jurisdiction had at least one of those four features of the law? Next slide, please. So comparison mode would do just that. So we call this the OR query. It displays up to four differences simultaneously using four different colors that you see here in the corners of those squares. So it allows us to see variation in the law a little bit more dynamically. So now I can see where states have one or more of those features that we just selected. And clearly a larger number of states are highlighted on the map showing me more interesting ways in which these features may or may not be common among states. So more than one variable can ultimately be assigned to the same color too. So it's a really great way of navigating the data and seeing if there are particular relationships between variables. Next slide, please. And from the map, you can find the full list of answers to the questions and access the legal source, the full text of the law and any notes from our researchers about the answer or the legal source itself. So if you click on a single jurisdiction, if you're viewing the map or the table, the question and answer selected will appear. So those four questions we were looking at are what you see here, along with a link to the legal source. Next slide, please. So here I've clicked on the legal source for question 1.1, and that is allowing me to view the law that was cited to answer that particular question. So we talked a little bit in, uh, in Monocle how you would create a citation, you would link it to the appropriate question to cite the source for your response. And this is how you would ultimately view that on that atlas. So you can also view the full text of the law to read and copy the entire text uh, of that particular law as well. So you'll see underneath at the bottom there, there's view full law, and then that would take you to a pop out where you can read the full text. And so that's ultimately why we're capturing the full text of all these laws so that we can be transparent about what our sources are for the information that we are conveying on Law Atlas. Next slide, please. A couple of other cool features in Law Atlas, if you're navigating the data set, you can readily export visualizations of maps or tables as a PNG file, which is really nice. So if you take a look at the data set and you find some interesting features relevant to your own work, I certainly encourage you to use that feature and share any relevant findings. So there's a lot to call from this data, as we will see in just a moment, and we really want you to make use of it. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, you will uh, see if you scroll down options to freely download the data. Once again, that's in a CSV file. So there's the statistical and summary data that you can take a look at there, the code book in order to read and understand the data, and then that research protocol, which again, outlines the entire process this team used in creating their data. Um, and you can access that there. And Finally, you might be a researcher or a policy analyst working on a paper. You might find this data set of interest to cite to it. Um, we have a nice feature that was newly 
newly added on um, on Law Atlas called the export citation button. So that provides ready-made citations of the data so that you can attribute the data properly. So if, if you find this data useful in your own work, then you can use that button to make a handy dandy citation. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, um, we would like to hear from you. If you're interested in Monocle or Law Atlas and would like to know more, I've included my email address as well as the contact info for Jonathan Larson, who is our legal technology manager. So we'd be happy to do demonstrations for you if you're interested or answer any questions you might have about either of those resources and also some other social media contact info there. So um, Thank you so much. I think one more slide, please. Those are just the uh, web pages you can visit. So lawatlas.org, pdops.org, which is the prescription drug abuse policy system. Um, very similar to Law Atlas, it's specific to drug policy and phlr.org is our center's website. So thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it back over to Q and excited to hear from Phyllis about this data set. Great. Thank you. Actually, Leah, can we go back uh, two slides uh, for a second? Just to, um, I think there have been some. Uh, thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, I, uh, you know, one thing I, I just want to kind of take a moment to appreciate is um, you've done such a fantastic job of making something that can be very intimidating. Um, very accessible. And I also want to acknowledge that uh, some of this may still feel intimidating for folks. And so I really appreciate you uh, putting in the links to how to contact you. There have been some questions in the um, chat box um, about Monocle. And I think with so many different uh, pieces of the puzzle that we're talking about today. I just wanted to take a quick pause uh, and ask some uh, a question about um, just generally, I know you said people could email you or Jonathan. If someone wants access to Monocle, uh, how would they go about creating an account? Is there a cost involved? Um, and um, yeah, yeah, just kind of open it up. See if you can uh, answer those quickly right now before we move on. No, thank you, Hugh. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say first and foremost to to get a hold of us to set up an account because um, we are currently funded to offer access to Monocle if you are at an academic or a nonprofit organization. And so if you are working in a larger team, we would love to get a sense of what your project goals are. If you'd like to use Monocle for your own policy surveillance or legal FE work, just to get a sense of how many accounts you would need um, or if it would be an individual account and ultimately um, the organization you're at. So I would recommend you get a hold of one of us and we will be sure to follow up with you to get you set up with an account. Great. And Law great. Atlas, you also, um, I think in order to download the data or download anything from Law Atlas, you will be prompted to create an account, but that's completely free to access. Great. Thank you. Thank okay. you. All right. So um, again, if you have questions, we are looking through the chat, but uh, we also have the introductions in the chat. If you do have questions, I have pulled some of the questions from the chat and I'll be asking those also, but there's also a Q&A button that saves the questions uh, in uh, an area that's a little bit easier for uh, us to find. Um, Leah, can you forward uh, two slides? Great. Um, you know, while we're on this little bit of a, uh, you know, pause to talk about, you know, how to wrap your, your you know, your arms around something that is, um, can seem intimidating or uh, like a lot to take on, um, you know, you can go through the steps of playing around with the data set, um, you know, doing searches, or a great way that I've been introduced to it is going to the work that Phyllis had and uh, the team that we've talked about um, that uh, Haley introduced um, have put together. This is a great way to get your uh, feet wet and to get introduced to the topic without having to do all the searches uh, yourself and figuring uh, everything out. Um, so I'm so excited now to introduce uh, Phyllis Jaden uh, to introduce 
um, the racial equity data set and also do a live demonstration, which I also think uh, will really help. Uh, Phyllis is a senior attorney with the Network for Public Health Laws Mid-States Region Office, where she focuses on health equity and public health authority work. Phyllis also has experience in the areas of public benefits, housing, consumer protection, employment, and in protection from abuse. Prior to joining the network, Phyllis spent several years on social justice and equity work while employed with other legal nonprofits, including the largest provider of free legal services in Michigan. Thank you, Q, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to Leah for handling the tech side of things today. Uh, for the background of the project from Haley and Alex, thank you for that overview of uh, Monocle and Law Atlas. If we could, all right, this is the right slide, but Leah, would you mind um, sticking the link back in the chat? I think it was asked for just a bit ago for um, to get to the data set on the network site. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and forgive me, Leah, if that's difficult to do, we can, we can sort that out in a little bit. Um, so as Haley explained, this project, it was not initially designed for the data gathered to be coded using Monocle and to be um, housed on Law Atlas. It was, as Haley mentioned, it was designed by the former director of the health equity team that was Don Hunter. I was on the health equity team when this project first started along with Haley. And we were uh, interested again, as Haley touched on, in taking a dive into the legislative outcome of what we have been referring to as the renewed racial justice movement of 2020 and seeing what laws had popped up in the 21 and 2022 legislative cycles. Once that data was gathered, uh, Don realized that Law Atlas would be a wonderful place to showcase the data, to make it accessible and usable for others who do work or research in this area, as Alex uh, went over with us. And I did see a question in the chat on whether these were um, proposed or enacted laws. As Haley touched on, there was a just so much information gathered from the proposed laws. What ended up in the data set, we pared down to only those enacted state laws. So Haley and I, we were new to uh, legal epidemiology and to using Monocle prior to this project. But after we spent many hours, as Haley said, retrofitting this data for Law Atlas, we did, we agreed that the efforts were well worth it. And um, we do hope that you find the data we gathered and coded accessible and useful for this sort of snapshot in time for 21 and 22 legislative cycles. We found so many interesting things doing this work um, and it drove many thoughtful discussions throughout the course of the project. One of those discussions revolved around whether this data set should focus on generally health equity or racial health equity specifically. So ultimately we decided that because the vast majority of laws that were coded related specifically to racial health equity, if we included those just handful of laws that did not and made this more of a general health equity data set, we would um, really be watering down our data and making it less useful for those who are focused specifically on racial health equity and may otherwise pass by this tool, finding it too general for their work. So we'll touch on an example of those laws that didn't make it into the data set later um, but for now, we can go ahead and dive into the data set itself, and um, I'll start with explaining a bit about how it's set up, and then we'll go ahead for a live demonstration to explore the data itself. If you can go to the next slide, please. So as Alex mentioned, the way the data is set up is answers to questions. And here, as you can see in that yellow oval, the first question, the parent question was, was a law enacted? in 2021 or 2022 that relates to racial health equity and that was still in effect on December 31st, 2022. And you'll recall, uh, Haley noted, the laws were coded answering yes to these questions based on those keyword searches, meaning that there may be laws that would be reasonably seen as answering yes to that question, but we did not capture because they were not identified through our keyword searches. So as you can see on the screen, all these states that had legislation that was responsive to um, that first parent question in the affirmative, 
they were coded into appropriate buckets or um, a bucket of social determinants of health. Of health. Uh, we have the example on the screen. Um, and if you can actually go to the next slide, please. You can see um, child questions flow from that parent question where we coded legislation into those appropriate buckets on, of the social determinants of health. And that example on the screen circles the first child question, does the law relate to healthcare access and quality? Now for the example on the screen, I click the blue button. So all the states with answers that are responsive to the parent question and this particular child question are now are marked with blue in that bottom right corner. So now we can see all the laws that were responsive to the parent question that also fall into the bucket of relating to healthcare access and quality. So if we were on the Live Law Atlas page and you scroll down, you would see other questions relating to other areas of social determinants of health. For example, does the law relate to education access and quality? Does the law relate to neighborhood and built environment? And then there's social and community context and uh, economic stability. Then you could click any of those buttons either alone or in addition to each other to see how many laws touched on any of those social determinants of health. You know the next slide, please. So under the child questions, we have grandchild questions to help make better use of this data under each social determinant of health area. For example, um, under the question of does law does a law relate to healthcare access and quality, that uh, first grandchild question is does the law also relate to data collection and reporting? And if I were to click yes under that question using the yellow button, you can see an overlapping yellow marker in that bottom left corner. That indicates that those laws with all three markers are laws that were responsive to that initial parent question, our child question regarding healthcare access and quality, and then also to the uh, child, the grandchild question of data collection and reporting. Next slide, please. So if we were to leave all the check boxes we just discussed uh, marked as yes, uh, we could then click on Maryland. And for this particular law, it states that Pathways, the Pathways to Health Equity Program um, is to be established by the commission, that would be the uh, Maryland Community Health Resources Commission. And that program will provide grant funding to reduce health disparities, improve health outcomes, improve access to primary care, promote primary and secondary prevention services, and reduce health care costs in hospital admissions and readmissions. Next slide, please. So we had other questions that did not, um, we wanted to pose other questions to categorize this legislation that was outside of those social determinants of health areas to try to sort of pick up on other legal trends we may be seeing um, or that we expected to see. So those trends that would either have the effect of advancing or impeding race, racial health equity. So on the screen, we have those other questions as does a law require implicit bias and or cultural competency slash sensitivity training? Does a law create a task force, committee, work group, or similar entity? Does the law relate to a declaration of racism as a public health crisis? Does the law explicitly prohibit or restrict education or training that addresses health or racial equity? And does a law restrict diversity, equity, and inclusion related actions at educational institutions? For that last question, we do have some questions underneath that flow from it on the same topic of DEI related uh, actions at educational institutions. So this is a good time. Now we can go ahead and start our live demonstration, but first let's go ahead to the next slide. We'll get you access. You may have already clicked the button in the chat, but we also have um, a QR code on the screen. So before I pull up the data set web page, I want to provide that QR code for folks who do want to follow along. So that QR code, it will lead you to a network web page, and it's going to provide a little bit of background on the data set. If you were to scroll down to the bottom, you will see to the right of the points of interest section, what's an, an explore the data here button. If you click that button, it will take you to the Law Atlas page that I am going to try to bring up to you right now. Give me just one moment to share my screen here. Okay, and hopefully everybody can see that. Okay. 
Okay, and so hopefully you can see this well um, on the screen here. That is the Law Atlas webpage. If you again, if you hit that that link we provided and you hit the Explore the Data Here button, you will get to this Law Atlas page. So before we dive in, I'll scroll down to the bottom here just to point out something that Haley mentioned, that if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see the About the Data Set um, section and next to it where you can press a button to download data, download a code book, and download the protocol. So if we scroll back up here, you can see we are in the uh, comparison mode. And I've already clicked that first color indicator for all the states that had legislation responsive to the first parent question there. And those are going to be marked in purple in the uh, top left corner. And you can see then all those states that said that had responsive answers to that question. So for this demonstration, let me go ahead and click the second child question. That's 1.2. Does the law relate to education access and quality? And I will go ahead and click blue to indicate which laws are responsive to both of those answers. And then under that, I'm going to go to the grandchild question of does the law regulate curriculum requirements or prohibitions? And that's going to be marked in yellow. So now for all those states that had legislation responsive to each one of those answers, you can see the bottom left corner is highlighted in yellow. Now, if I go ahead, all right, and click on, let's click on Georgia. And I'm gonna click this view full law button. And hopefully you can see that, okay. Um, this law from Georgia, this is GA code section 20-2-739 and it states, on and after July 1st, 2000, the Department of Education shall provide training programs in conflict management and resolution and cultural diversity for voluntary implementation by local boards of education for school employees, parents and guardians and students, provided, however, that after July 1st, 2022, such training programs shall not advocate for divisive concepts as such term is defined in code section 20-1-11. So with that, we click out of this, go back to Georgia. So I can show you the law 20-1-11 uh, that defines divisive concepts. So an excerpt from that law, it states under subsection A, as used in this code, as used in this code section, the term one divisive concepts means any of the following concepts, including views espousing such concepts. A, one race is inherently superior to another race. B, the United States of America is fundamentally racist. C, an individual by virtue of his or her race is inherently or consciously racist or oppressive towards individuals of other races. D, an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race. And the law goes on, of course. Let's click out of Georgia and we'll go ahead and click on Florida. And you can see a law effective on July 1st, 2022, that also centers around certain concepts. Um, and those listed, they're not so dissimilar to um, those we just discussed in the Georgia law. And hopefully you can read that on the screen. I'm gonna go ahead and read off to you a section of the law. It states in part, it shall constitute discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, or sex under this section to subject any student or employee to training or instruction that espouses, promotes, advances, inculcates, or compels such student or employee to believe any of the following concepts. One, members of one race, color, national origin, or sex are morally superior to members of another race, color, national origin, or sex. Two, a person by virtue of his or her race, color, national origin, or sex is inherently racist, sexist, oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. And it goes on from there. Now, um, this is part of what's been dubbed as Florida's Stop Woke Act. 
but was uh, titled as the Individual Freedom Law, or excuse me, the Individual Freedom Act. And I wanna click on that again. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. And again, hopefully you're able to see this all. Okay, um, here we go. In uh, Florida Statute Section 1003.42, it states in part under subsection three, the legislature acknowledges the fundamental truth that all persons are equal before the law and have inalienable rights. Accordingly, instruction and supporting materials on the topics enumerated in this section must be consistent with the following principles of individual freedom. A, no person is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously, solely by virtue of his or her race or sex. So portions of this act are being challenged. We won't get into that here today. Um, we will mention, however, you can see Tennessee is also highlighted. They also have a uh, law banning trainings for students and employees in higher education on, again, divisive concepts. And Iowa law also uses the term specified divisive concepts. Um, it's relevant here to note that there is a September 22nd, 2020 executive order that also set forth requirements that were purportedly aimed at promoting unity in the federal workplace by similarly prohibiting workplace training on those so-called divisive concepts. So as you can see, we have remarkably similar language and ideas put forth in several states across the country after that order was issued. So we're, we're showing you these to highlight one way that this data set can help you with your work. As you can see, with the laws we just discussed, it can help make uh, apparent some of the trends in this sort of snapshot in time of 21 and 22. For this particular trend, it seemed to be emerging at this time. So it's nice to have a snapshot of what was going on in 21 and 22 because these this movement has continued to grow since. So again, this is just one trend that became clear with the data set and you are free to, of course, go to the data set, explore these other states. Um, so despite this more disturbing trend, we did discover more hopeful themes. Um, for example, if we click on Delaware, um, for Delaware, you can see a curriculum, uh, a curriculum requirement that was made effective on June 17, 2021. And the law states that each school district and charter school serving students in one or more of grades K through 12 shall provide instruction on Black history. Um, we have some other positive trends we'll go ahead and note. And for this, I'm gonna clear my variables on the data set, go back to that parent question and click yes again under purple for the first parent question for those laws that are responsive. And I'm gonna scroll down to question 1.6. All right, and 1.6 says, does the law require implicit bias and or cultural competency slash sensitivity training? And I'll go ahead and click yes there. And you can see several states enacted laws that require implicit bias and or cultural competency slash sensitivity training, including Florida. Um, in Nebraska, go ahead and click Nebraska here. Let's see if I can highlight this a little bit for you because it's a small snippet of this law. Um, eight hours of anti-bias and implicit bias training are now part of requirements for a non-certified conditional officer to interact with the public and to carry a firearm. So now, if I were to leave those marked as yes, scroll back up and add healthcare access and quality as another yes answer and click that box, um, you can see several of those laws uh, requiring training in this area. Let me do that so you can see it better. Um, are in the area of healthcare access and quality. In Washington, for example, under Washington Revised Code Section 28B.10.698, uh, it states in part within existing resources by January 1st, 2023, the School of Medicine at the University of Washington and the School of Medicine at the Washington State University um, shall each develop curriculum on health equity for medical students. So I'm gonna clear the variable just one more time. Hopefully I'm not overwhelming you with data. Again, I'll click yes on our parent question to highlight those states that answered yes. And I'm gonna scroll down to question 1.8 and click yes in blue on that. So this question 
asks if the law relates to a declaration of racism as a public health crisis. So as you can see, we only coded two states with laws relating to uh, racism as a public health crisis. However, we know um, from work, for example, from the um, American Public Health Association that declarations of racism as a public health crisis have been made in 22 states at the state level. I believe it's 22 states. We wanted to see how many of these laws would mention declarations within the body of the law. But we only found this language, at least for this time period, in Illinois and New York law. And the New York law is the declaration itself. So with that said, the preamble section of a lot of these bills did reference racism as a public health crisis. So it appears that it was part of the reasoning and what prompted laws, even though we did not code the bill as relating to racism as a public health crisis, because the text of the law itself did not make it explicit. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and ask if Leo would kindly bring up the slides again. Great, thank you for that. So as you can see, there are so, um, there are so many points of data to discuss. We could truly go on for some time on this. Um, for example, our research uncovered laws that didn't fit uh, within the categories of the data set, or maybe they were out of the strict timeline, so we didn't include them in the end. Or again, they may not have focused specifically on racial health equity, and therefore were not included. However, many of these laws do address issues that disproportionately impact communities of color. So one example, uh, there's a Connecticut law that established a doula advisory committee, so it didn't explicitly target racial equity. However, we know that the rate of maternal injury, illness, or uh, death during pregnancy, childbirth, or postpartum um, for Black pregnant people will far exceed that of white pregnant people. And doula care, we know, can improve these outcomes by providing emotional, physical, and educational support. There was another law in California that fell within the timeline. But again, it did not address racial health equity specifically, so it was not included in the data set. That law was for the uh, transgender gender non-conforming and intersex wellness and equity fund. Much like the law for the doula advisory committee in Connecticut, this law would be expected to improve outcomes um, of health for people of color, though it was not stated explicitly. And so again, was left out of the data set. And I have one more example, an Alabama law that created uh, the Alabama Workforce and Wage Gap Task Force. That bill was introduced um, and it called out the large wage gap for Black and Latina women in the state in the preamble. And then in the law itself, it did include language to make certain that the task force was, quote, inclusive and that it reflected, quote, the racial, gender, geographic, urban, rural, and economic diversity of the state. And it also included language that three members appointed by the governor were to be representatives of the university colleges of business and management, and that one of those representatives was from a historically black college or university. That law became effective on June 12th, 2022, but it fell out of the data set because it was, um, it, it, you, you had to stay within the data set, the timeline meant a law had to be effective on December 31st, 2022, and that was the date that particular law was dissolved. So it didn't make it in the data set. That's several. We have so many interesting items and points to discuss from this data set. We look forward to discussing them further, perhaps in other presentations. We do hope, though, that you leave this presentation feeling confident to go and investigate the data set yourself. Discover those points of interest for yourself, um, because they're just more than we have the time to discuss here. I will make uh, another point, though, that is especially relevant during voter registration week. The data set does highlight the importance of voting in all elections. So again, you see on the screen the QR code. It'll take you to the network page that provides a bit of background on the data set. You can then scroll down a bit and click the Explore the Data Here button to take you to that Law Atlas page we were looking at. And if you would go to the next slide, please. Here is my contact information. Please reach out to us for any questions on this, any assistance. We are very happy to help and answer those questions. And I will go ahead now and hand this back over to Q for our Q&A. Yeah, <laughs> I, 
Uh, the slide cracks me up. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, Phyllis, I, before we get jump into Q&A, and there are some questions both in the Q&A and in the chat, I just wanted to um, kind of highlight uh, two things that Phyllis uh, talked about. You know, at the, uh, at the very beginning of her presentation, Phyllis uh, said that she was new to this. Um, you know, she was new to using the software. She was new to using a lot um, to, to navigating um, the legislation in this way. And yet by the very end, you were saying things like, I wrote down here, I'm gonna go ahead and clear my variables, head back into the child question, and then let's pop on over to Nebraska. So I, I, I think that, um, I think just hearing you and all the presenters talk about uh, your work uh, in this, I just wanted to thank you for your work in this, making it more accessible, um, for uh, the rest of us that are jumping in here. Um, and then the other thing I really wanted to call out is even in just the the um, the example you gave of the law in uh, Georgia, uh, in the chat box, there's a, um, a conversation that is was started uh, just by looking at that uh, from Attica Scott, our Good friend Attica Scott in Kentucky talked about how they had copied that law uh, in Kentucky right there in that, that house um, and um, other folks then uh, able to uh, join in and talk about uh, maybe the source of some of these laws from Alec and other uh, uh, other um, uh, purveyors of these laws. So uh, I think this discussion is really useful to have and it's also really useful to have people kind of jump into uh, being able to navigate uh, these laws also. So just wanted to thank you again, Phyllis, and thank all the moderators, uh, I mean, all the panelists, um, and then we can jump into questions and answers. All right, just uh, in terms of uh, questions and answers, I, I also wanted to make a note that we are a little bit past the top of the hour. Um, this is a 90 minute webinar, so we have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, and uh, for those of you who, um, you know, uh, uh, are uh, jumping off, um, we will be recording and uh, sending this out next week. Um, but I do want to get to questions. And the, um, one of the first questions that I wanted to start with um, is the question of where should people start? Okay. Like, you know, everyone's just listened to this webinar. They have access to the links that are provided. Um, this is a question for each uh, each panelist. Where do you think people should start? Where, where should people go next? What's the next step? Alex can probably speak better to this part. Well, of course she can, which is um, there is a introduction to how to use Monocle on, on Law Atlas or how to use Law Atlas, if you'd like to talk to that, Alex, please. Yeah, there are resources on Law Atlas that talk about how to navigate. I talked about um, the filter mode, the comparison mode. So if you take a look on lawatlas.org, you can find resources there. There are also resources on our learning resources tab where you can take a look at self-guided modules. If you are interested in policy surveillance, if it's a new topic to you, I also would recommend taking a look at those. You can learn a little bit more about legal mapping. And then if you visit the more tab, you can click on how to use Law Atlas and there you'll find a couple of quick videos that demonstrate how to navigate some of the information. And so if you want to take a closer look, I would definitely recommend taking a look at those two places for more information, again, on how to do policy surveillance, what it is, and then also on how to use Law Atlas as well. And I'll add, um, you you may, if, if you'd like, you can. We don't want it to be a barrier to you jumping into the data set. Feel free to jump in the data set. Play with it a little bit to get used to it. Um, and maybe that'll prompt you to want to use those uh, resources to learn a little bit better how to use it. But look at the area that you work in the most, perhaps, and, and start playing with the data to see what pops out to you. Yeah, I think it's important to know that there is something in this data set 
for everyone, right? It's not just limited to health equity. Um, we touch on education, housing policy. There are a lot of really interesting laws around housing um, access. And uh, one I remember is some implicit bias training in real estate. Um, but anyway, there's something in there for everyone. Uh, so take a look at it. It can be very informative and you might be surprised what you find. Yeah, those I I love those responses, and I want to build on a couple of them. I think, um, it, it you know there will be some folks on this webinar who I think are ready to um, email Alexandra and talk about whether they qualify for a free monocle license and to talk about other uh, that and get started. We saw in the chat box there's uh, there are folks working on a similar project in Massachusetts, um, so. It's exciting that there's that level of user. Um, and I think for others, what I would recommend is click on the network link, go to the data set uh, and just play around. Look at this. This question looks interesting to me. I'm going to read it. What is this state? Oh, it the, the state's changed. What does that mean? Let me click on Georgia again. They said something on the webinar about Georgia. I live in Oregon. What, what's going on there? And then just uh, have that be um, your introduction to the both the laws, the data, and the process. Uh, and then when you're ready to, you know, build, uh, compare, filter, look, uh, then maybe go back to the resources and, uh, you know, contact us at the network, contact um, Alexandra uh, at the center and, um, you know, uh, you know, see if there's another training or another conversation that can be had in order to move your specific project along. But I would say, orient yourself. Uh, don't let um, you know the uh, the the any barriers to creating your project right now stand in the way. Um, some so of the specific questions that have come in. One question is. Um, Will this data set capture legislation that is likely to have an equitable impact, but that does not specifically mention equity? For example, uh, laws that are aimed at reducing the killing of pedestrians by cars. Let me throw that out to Phyllis first, because I think the doula example you gave in Connecticut um, is, a, is a good comparison. Um, can you uh, talk, uh, respond to that question, and then I'll open it up to the other panelists as well? Yeah, of course, I'm happy to. And I think that question was asked before I had a chance to discuss some of those other laws that didn't make it into the data set, because again, they didn't focus specifically on racial health equity, maybe they fell out of our timeline, or there's a couple other reasons we mentioned. Um, I, I will say, though, um, if it, 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 we used, as Haley mentioned, that we came up with keyword searches, so if it did not appear through our keyword search, we did not find it. Of course, that doesn't mean it wouldn't necessarily be responsive to our parent question, but we found our answers through specific keyword searches. I will say, um, I think this, the data set does speak well to the um, concept of health and all policies because it truly does look at the social determinants of health, um, not just in those traditional sort of public health um, Think, excuse me, those public health measures, but things like Haley said, like training on bias in um, uh, real estate, for example. So it truly does kind of take into account the the concept of health and all policies. But I'll let other folks chime in as well. No, I, I think Phyllis pretty fully answered uh, the question. Uh, be, because we weren't really interpreting laws, um, as Phyllis mentioned, we couldn't include everything, right? Um, but there's something in all policy areas. And just a quick clarification, this is a particular data set that we're presenting on today. If folks had other, Alexander, if folks had a specific question and they are ready to um, you know, work in Law Atlas and Monocle. What is the universe of laws that they're able to look at? Like, how are those? Um, you know, what's what's the outer parameters for those laws? In terms of like any sort of legal mapping project, or the ones that are on uh, Law Atlas specifically. 
Yeah, so in terms of like accessing the information on a particular data set, you can find the text of every law that was collected and ultimately used to do the coding. So that's, um, I talked a little bit about creating the citations. That's how you link the text of the law to what we're ultimately, you know, what's the foundation for all of this coding. So you can find all of those laws and you can extract them. You can download the full legal text of all the laws that were captured in a data set that way. Um, you can also look to the data page itself, which will, and the summary data page should include citations to all of the legal text that was cited. So that's also a good place to look as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Alexandra, a few questions came in in the chat box about, uh, you know, accessing you. Do you mind putting your email into the chat box? I know it's on the slides, which we will be sharing uh, for questions that people had about uh, monocle access. Definitely. I just shared that in the chat now. Thank you. Of Thank course. you. I'm going to stay with you, um, Alexandra, and ask you another question. Um, uh, the question, um, you know, we know that if a law is on the books, it could be um, held unconstitutional later or, um, you know, may have some kind of a court challenge later, otherwise deemed un unenforceable by the court. Um, is that case, in that case, um, how might that show up in legal data? Um, can Monocle or Law Atlas uh, capture that consideration? Yeah, thank you for that question. I also wanted to get back to your first question, If and I apologize if I misunderstood. I think Leslie asked a clarifying question in the chat, so I also wanted to answer that uh, as well. But if you are interested in other like topic areas, you can also find on Law Atlas, if you browse our data there, you can also search by topic. So we have a uh, ton of different public health topics, as I think many of us know here, really everything and anything can be public health law. So you can also, I would say, if you're interested in a particular topic area that might touch on health equity, which as we know, can really be everything, um, I would recommend you navigate our our data there as well. There also is contact information listed so you can identify who created that data if you'd like to reach out and collaborate or if you're interested or have a question. Um, I would take a look, browse our data, and then you can also see who created it. And if you um, are interested, you can also look to contact the creator of that data set because in addition to our own data, we also support publication of data sets like this one created by the network uh, as well. So I just wanted to mention that. I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, but as to your question, Q, yeah, I think this data set is also maybe a good example of instances where the law that's on the books isn't necessarily always capturing exactly what's happening on the ground in terms of implementation or enforcement or funding and so on. And so there are also instances in many areas of law where this is particularly relevant when um, perhaps there's actual legal text, but that law may have been enjoined by a court, so it's not actually being enforced. And that's also really relevant context when we're thinking about like how laws are affecting us, right? And so we in our methodology have uh, adopted certain measures that we can use to also capture and code things like case law or attorney general opinions, for example, so that we can further contextualize how the law is actually being enforced or whether it's being enforced. We can create actual coding questions to ask about things like case law. We have a function in Monocle, which is called a caution note, which essentially allows you to uh, add and contextualize um, the enforcement or enforceability of a law with some of that nuance. You can literally go in and add a note related to any particular law about for example, if it has been enjoined or if it's been held unconstitutional. So I would also say if you're interested in tracking something like that and to also further, you know, provide context as to, um, because we, as we know, laws that are simply on the books aren't always the full picture of what's happening, um, especially when we're thinking about health equity and racism and how that's built into the law. Um, th there are other ways of incorporating that information and contextualizing that information through Monocle and Law Atlas as well. Thanks, Alexandra, for 
for uh, answering that and the um, and uh, Leslie's uh, reframing of the question also. I wanna jump back into the question and answer box. I'm gonna just highlight some of the questions that have been answered um, you know, uh, by our panelists uh, in case others uh, might have been thinking about the questions also. Um, there was uh, a question about, uh, do either Monocle or Law Atlas allow for mapping of city county legislative policies? Uh, and Alexandra, you answered yes. Uh, uh, Monaco Law Atlas support legal mapping at the local level. What is what do you mean? What what is that question getting at? What do you mean by that? Yeah, thanks for that question. So I know this is a state level data set, but you may not be a, for your own work necessarily be interested in comparing state level policy. Perhaps you're at the city or county level, or even looking at school districts. Maybe you do a, a global legal research. So Monaco supports, um, you know multiple jurisdictional levels so you can select if you're working in states or cities or counties and then when you create those jurisdictions within your records in monocle it will um, identify those and so that's how we are able to support the map on law atlas so you can look at law at multiple levels of government and so uh, we definitely work with folks who do a lot of local research in cities and counties. Um, so you can certainly use this for, for that work as well. There's a, thank you, Alexandra. There was a question about uh, federal level. Um, I know there's been some discussion already about federal executive orders that are related to um, uh, the Georgia, uh, the Georgia law. Um, what about federal law? What, what should folks know about federal law? Haley, if you'd like to answer, considering you did a lot of this background research, I will just say we didn't research the federal laws um, for this set, but please, Haley. Yeah, um, we were really interested in this data set specifically about the 50 states and how state legislatures in particular were reacting to this renewed racial justice movement. Um, so I did not do any research into federal laws um, for this particular data set. All right. Um, to add to that, I know Haley, you mentioned in the chat that the um, specifically the divisive concepts law was um, something that was noted in the chat was a lot of those looked similar across states, and I think you mentioned that um, there was was it an executive order um, that was issued that states kind of incorporated into their own divisive concept laws. So I know that it wasn't necessarily a legal mapping of federal law per se, but that it certainly, you know, demonstrates how a lot of um, states were incorporating at least that particular executive order into their own legislation. So um, I think there's definitely a lot to to call from that data to see the relationship between what was happening at the federal level and also what was going on within state legislatures. So I just wanted to uplift what you said a moment ago in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. It can kind of reveal, reveal trends that led to further research. Oh, this is really interesting. So many states have the exact same language in their laws. Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know, I think Darlene put a link in the chat to a resource and also maybe um, April as well discussing that specific executive order. That's right. Thank you for uh, reminding us of that. If you scroll up in the chat, if you're interested in that divisive concepts uh, at the federal level, that executive order, um, uh, yeah, Darlene Briggs and April Shaw, Darlene Briggs, um, Wong Briggs and uh, April Shaw from the network uh, link posted a couple of links to that. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. All right, I wanted to, um, there was a question about um, a summary of the data, um, you know, uh, some kind of uh, comparative analyses uh, of the law. Um, I think Leslie asked this question uh, in the Q&A and Phyllis um, says that that's certainly something we are discussing, uh, have not determined exactly what our next steps are yet. And I think that, you know, I think that the way we've been talking about this is this is a great starting off point for us and anyone else who wants to jump in. Um, this can be your starting off point for uh, any articles that you're writing or analyses that you're doing. 
uh, on this topic and to increase the scholarship uh, and analysis in this area. And then, um, you know, whatever additional legal research you do in order to make sure that what you're looking at is uh, updated or applicable to other areas uh, would be also really important. Um, you know, steps in the process also. Um, anything to add to that, um, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, where folks can take this or whether you have any ideas about where you would like to see this to go next? Haley, please. Uh, Phyllis mentioned uh, during her presentation that we had many, many thoughtful conversations about the trends and things we were seeing in this data set. Um, and I know at one point we had a running list of things that we would like to write about at some point in the future. Um, so this data set, when we say it has everything and something for everyone, it truly, truly does. There are so many things you could write about or compare just based on this little data set. Um, and, I, and I hope everyone makes, makes use of it in that way. Yes, thank you, Haley. And and we do, we have a running list because there were so many things that came up throughout this. Um, and I will say even just based on the laws that we didn't include, um, some of the most interesting talking points came up. And so there were things that we have put aside to hopefully write about and discuss at, at later points, but um, we did mention a couple, but I will say that's just one aspect of the data set that the work could continue on. wanted to highlight a question that's maybe related to this um, and maybe going more into the substance rather than the you know process. Um, as you were putting this together, were there one or two types of policies that rose to the top uh, as potential models uh, for states to consider for advancing racial health equity? I, I will say that some of those policies could be found in education, unfortunately, alongside other, other policies that can be expected to have the opposite impact. Um, and I will say there was some, some laws that I just, that struck me particularly um, because of, of how unique and, and thoughtful they came across. I, I have one moment, let me find a note I have on one law. Um, let's see here. There is a, and of course I'm not seeing it now, but there was a, a law in California that uh, it was very interesting, it was a criminal, uh, it, oh yeah, no, I have it right here. Forgive me, this is California Evidence Code uh, section 352.2, for those of those who wanna write, write that, who would like to write that down. It's uh, creative expression as evidence in criminal proceedings. And um, it states that uh, you cannot uh, convict someone based on, uh, forgive me, um, it, it relates to, excuse me, it relates to introducing evidence in a criminal proceeding based on what we're calling creative expression, such as someone's uh, type of music they might be playing in a car before they are stopped for um, a search. And so there was, there was a few other laws that came up like that. That's one that comes to the top of my mind that I thought was um, particularly interesting. I thought, um some of the implicit bias slash cultural sensitivity laws were really interesting um, in the way that they were incorporated into state laws. A lot of them required medical schools to include implicit bias or cultural sensitivity training as part of their curriculum, or they were required as part of continuing education requirements um, in particular different, different fields. Um, so I feel like those laws generally kind of give a model of how states can be more intentional about requiring implicit bias and cultural sensitivity training for healthcare professionals or other types of professionals that are regulated by um, regulatory agencies and licensing. Thank you. A, a related question that's come up, and I think is a really helpful practical question, is, um, you know, understanding that the data set includes laws that are both good and bad, so to speak. Um, is there an easy way to search between good and bad or uh, health equity promoting versus undermining laws? Um, I, I, Haley, you can feel free to speak up to this as well. Uh, I would say there isn't 
maybe an easy way, but if you look at the questions, especially those questions that don't relate to social determinants of health, for example, regarding the types of trainings that Haley was just discussing, which we would put in the, the good category, or the um, DEI restrictions that we would put in the not so good category. So um, that is, that's one way to kind of tease out those points, but there isn't sort of the good and the bad column, though, if you, if you take a look, it may become more apparent with the questions and the, the sub questions. Yeah, okay, that's that's uh, that's good to know. I, I, I think that we do have some resources uh, and other uh, of our partners do have some resources where we've looked at, um, you know, laws that have been, you know, uh, helpful or hurtful to public health authorities, certainly. And I think this is a great, uh, it's a great, um, you know, the question came up earlier of, you know, how are we going to analyze this and write about it? Um, how are others going to uh, analyze and write about it. And I think that that would be a great, um, you know, uh, a great way to present this information. So thank you for that question um, uh, from the person who sent it. Um, a lot of questions have come up about the time frame for this. Um, and I really appreciate, um, you know, uh, the panelists talking about, um, you know, this moment in time where this data set came up um, you know, post uh, 2020 and looking at 2021 and 2022 as a data set. A few questions have come up about what about data, what about laws before then? What about laws after updates? Um, thoughts, plans, considerations? Uh, as, as far as the laws that came before, uh, many of those, for example, racism is a public health crisis. Um, those those that were enacted, uh, they believe they they came before, sort of that COVID nineteen era and this era where we saw what we we're again terming the renewed racial justice movement of of twenty twenty, and that is what prompted Don Hunter, again the uh, former director of health equity at the Network for Public Health Law. That's what prompted the discussion on, hey, what came out of that? What what bubbled up through the legislature after so much effort was put forth to highlight these injustices. And that is why the time frame starts there. And we are actually hoping because of that, it may be found particularly useful. And we do think, for example, that those um, those restrictions on, on education, a lot of that started, unfortunately, in response to this movement. And it was captured in this data set. So it would be very interesting to see this going forward in the 23 and 24 cycle, because we know that that trend continued. And I do believe that there is, um, I have it in my notes somewhere, the, uh, let's see here, I have um, a note that the, uh, that in UCLA, they have a project, the Critical Race Theory Ford Project of UCLA. They are, um, they are, they are uh, keeping track, track rather of a lot of these policies that are being introduced and enacted. So that's one place to look, but we know that these trends continued. So it's really cool to look at this time and see, okay, what bubbled up from that good and bad and let's track it, let's keep tracking it. What happened since? Thank you. Well, I, I um, just checking the time, we have a couple more minutes left um, and I wanted to, First of all, thank the, our panelists, uh, Haley, Alexandra, and Phyllis for a fantastic job today, as well as our host, uh, Leah. Um, and I wanted to um, remind you that uh, you will be getting a, a email with a notification of the slides and recording of this uh, within the next week. Um, and uh, I just like to, um, you know, go back to the idea of how to get started uh, and, you know, look, checking out the data set, checking out the, the link um, that, that has been provided here today, um, poking around and then asking a lot of these questions. I think um, we have a lot uh, uh, to go from in terms of where we take this data set uh, and how uh, all of you can utilize it to inform uh, your health equity work going ahead, uh, and as well as transforming it with your own work with Law Atlas and um, Monocle. So again, thanks to all of our panelists. Um, thank you all for your attention uh, and look for an email from us here at the network in the coming week. <laughs>